deep down, way on down, there is something stirring, something very, very valuable. It is a race to the bottom, to the bottom of the oceans, and it is deep sea mining. As far down as 5,000 metres, maybe more, lie a host of materials critical for modern society, from smartphones to electric cars to green energy. How can it be mined without ruining another beautiful, so far relatively untouched, yet valuable part of our planet? It's been called the new gold rush. The race is on to mine the precious minerals buried in the seabed. China hopes to play a leading role in the drive to extract the metals from the ocean floor. So far, China has four of the 29 deep sea exploration contracts issued by the International Seabed Authority, the most of any country. One of the contracts allocates a surface area of nearly 73,000 square kilometers of the clarion clipperton fracture zone in the Pacific Ocean. The International Seabed Authority is still writing the regulations, but says a big part of its mandate aims to minimise environmental harm. But research scientists at the University of Exeter are concerned that once the first commercial contract for mining is issued, there will be no going back. And there's still not enough research to confirm just what damage will be done to the environment. And I'm very pleased to say that joining us from Washington, D.C., we have Con Nugent, Project Director of Seabed Mining Project at the Pew Charitable Trusts. We cross to Kingston in Jamaica then, and to Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. While with me at the round table, we have Regan Drennan, Research Assistant at UK Seabed Resources, who studies the biodiversity of the ocean floor, and Charlotte Middlehurst, a contributing editor at China Dialogue, focusing on China's growing interest in deep sea mining. And indeed, Charlotte, everybody's the continued interest in, in deep sea mining, because it's not China, but China are taking a very firm hold on it at the moment. By no means just China, but China is making a play for power in this developing sector. China now owns the greatest number of licenses, uh, con contracts to start mining the seabed, um, particularly in the clarion Clipperton zone. Um, we shall refer to that in future as the CZZ okay. zone because it's quite well known and everybody here is aware of it. All it's right. just south of Hawaii, right? That's right, yeah. in the Pacific. Um, at the same time, China is conscious that it needs to develop this sector um, with an environmental conscience. Um, it's enshrined a commitment to safeguard the environment and mitigate any harm that is caused through mining um, in a law that it created in 2016. Um, it's also put the commitment in its five-year plan on seabed mining, which stretches from 2016 to 2021. Mm. Uh, but Con, I want to come to you first of all. We, we, we need what is on the ocean floor. I say we need, but at the moment there's no sign of that desire diminishing. We need it for smartphones, for new technology, for green energy, because there are so many different products down there that are vital at the moment. Um, it has to be controlled, doesn't it? Sure, of course it does. Like any uh, exploitative industry, it has to be regulated. That's why Michael is here this morning. And is it being regulated? Before I ask Michael what, what he does in his organization, do you think enough is being done? Well, I think the interesting part about this work is that it's the first opportunity in history to write a rule book to govern an industry before it begins. So there is no deep sea mining at present, and Michael runs the organization at which discussions, debates take place, which will inform the character of those of those regulations. So when we talk about the fact that China's pulling up deposits already, it, it's not doing it in a deep sea area, it's doing it in, what, coastal waters? China is, is uh, conducting operations in coastal waters, but they are exploratory. And in the deep sea, they are taking samples of the bottom. Um, no one is in exploitation phase. All those contracts are exploratory contracts. 
OK, Michael, do you, are you meeting any resistance in, in the kind of work you're trying to do from people who have what you might call their own national interests um, at heart? Well, I think it's uh, important to mention first, as uh, Con has already highlighted, that there is no mining or harvesting taking place at the moment at a commercial scale. Uh, there's still quite a number of challenges to be overcome before it begins. And what we're engaged in at the moment is exploration. Uh, in fact, there's nothing really new in this. We've been exploring the deep ocean for minerals since the 1960s. Uh, and not only that, we discovered that we could actually do it as long ago as the 1970s. Uh, the problem at the time was that it was way too expensive to harvest minerals from 5,000 meters deep and five or six days away from land, which is where the CCZ is. Uh, and also the world had not yet woken up to the fact that continuing to rely on coal and other fossil fuels to meet our energy needs was not going to be sustainable. But aren't we just going to be uh, raping another part of our beautiful planet to, to satisfy man's insatiable needs? Well, we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, and this is going to require massive quantities of new minerals, especially the minerals that we need for batteries, such as nickel, copper, and cobalt, which happen to be the minerals that are found in rich concentrations on the ocean floor. Uh, for example, the World Bank estimates that to get to a closed loop economy at some stage in the future, we'll need 40 times the total supply of minerals that we have today. And that's why we see increased interest in increased investment in deep sea exploration. And that includes, of course, research of the sort that uh, Drennan is doing on the ecological aspects and on the potential environmental impacts of mining. I suppose well I, what, I want, what I want to push on is, is the fact that, yeah, you say it's great to have these um, people are looking for it. We're, we're, we're going to need these materials uh, if we're going to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. But there is a danger that you are going to allow a beautiful natural resource to be pillaged and for it not to be able to recover. How do you stop that happening? Well, nobody's talking about pillaging. Uh, first of all, we have the fact that uh, this activity is very highly regulated. Uh, we have the International Seabed Authority. And I really can't emphasize this enough. Actually, contrary to uh, popular perception uh, in some places, the deep ocean, which actually covers 54% or so of the planet's surface, is not an unregulated space at all. In fact, it's the only example that we have of a space and a resource that is internationally managed for the benefit of all humanity. Uh, to put it another way, without ISA, we would have a free-for-all where anybody could access deep sea minerals without any kind of regulation at all. And then you may well uh, result in pillaging the resource. Uh, can, so in fact, can I, can I ISA, ask, Sorry, I will come back to you, Michael, but I just want to ask Regan a couple of questions because you were out there yeah. um, looking at pictures beamed up from the, 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 the seabed floor, from the, one of the deepest parts of the oceans, and you saw extraordinary things. Are you worried at all? Because you're working for the Seabed Authority, is that correct? Uh, yes, and I'm working at the Natural History... But you're also Martin. part of um, a Lockheed Martin project, and they, they are a military, well, largely known for their military capabilities and production. Are, are you worried at all about what might happen? Um, I think if you actually just take a step back and think that scientists like myself are actually getting the opportunity to be able to study this habitat mm -hmm. before regulation is put in place, before, um, before mining even occurs, is a re what makes it really unique in, in terms of exploitative uh, industries in the past and really makes it a unique point in history. So I think it's a huge positive that scientists like myself are actually being included in it and that there is an emphasis and push towards understanding these ecosystems before any of this is allowed to take place. And what you saw um it just amazed you, didn't it? Yeah, so it re they really are really incredible environments. We still know very little about the deep sea. Um, there's incredible animals from really brightly coloured sea cucumbers with big tails or kind of like bat wings for swimming to sponges made of glass. They have glass in their skeleton. They look like kind of flowers. And a lot of these... Was it not an octopus that it had ears like an elephant? Yeah, that too. All sorts of weird and wonderful kind of creatures as well. And a lot of them require the hard surface to be mined, for example, these polymetallic nodules that are the mining interest in this yeah, yeah. some of them require them to grow on. So, for example, corals and sponges, they need that hard surface to grow on. Yeah, and, and, and it can easily be spoiled. This, I was going to just quote an example here. 1989, the Peru Basin. 
they put down this massive, well, it was eight metre by eight metre, I think, um, plough, if you like, to see what might happen. It was scraped across the ocean floor, backwards and forwards, and they went back 26 years later to see what might have recovered. And the answer was nothing. It was exactly as it was. Yeah, so these Ruined. are really, really kind of low energy, cold, slow environments. So I think some of the oldest animals on the planet have been found in the deep sea. I think there was a coral discovered recently that was over 4,000 years old. So they're really slow environments. So direct impact will likely result in biodiversity loss that will be very difficult to recover from. What we really don't understand is any of the wider impacts as well. Some outside the area of uh, mining itself, how will this affect the ecosystem at large? How will this feed back into the oceans? We think that the deep sea could play a big role in terms of uh, carbon storage, heat, sequestration. So there could be further wider impacts that actually feed more directly back into but human society other than just the loss. Do of you believe that massive corporations who are putting millions and millions of dollars into this, and Lockheed Martin, as, as I mentioned, has been looking into this since the late 1970s. Do you believe they have altruistic ambitions here? Um, I, I think it's difficult to say and it's not really, really in my position to say but I think the fact that there is such funding for the science and funding to understand this and this emphasis and push towards all stakeholders to work together on this um, I think is a huge positive and I think we have to kind of look at that aspect. Yeah. So in terms of the motivations it's difficult to say but the fact that the outcome is currently a, a positive, I think that's a, it's a Connor Michael, I'll come to you in just a moment to ask for your thoughts on that. But Charlotte, there is not much evidence in the history of um, industrialised mankind mm. of corporations taking uh, a preemptive mm. uh, strike at doing what they do for the best of intentions rather than for their own selfish reasons. Well, quite. And I think it would be naive to assume that profit motive is coming after altruism um, when looking at the reasons why companies are undertaking uh, these ventures. And that's not to say that there aren't wider benefits for humanity to come out of these research and exploration trips. Um, but I think, yeah, it, 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 to assume that they're altruistic is going a bit far. So, so Michael, it's your job as the, the underwater policeman of the world, if, if I could be so flippant, um, to make sure that um, the floor isn't raped, that um, instances on a grander scale to the one I've just described where the seabed didn't recover f even in a quarter of a century are not allowed to happen. How do you do that? Well, correct. And that's, if I get about altruism, I don't think that's got anything to do with it. The reason that these uh, companies and countries are carrying out this important scientific work is because we, the ISA, tell them that they must do that. It's a requirement. Uh, and when I say the ISA, you must bear in mind that the ISA is actually 168 member states acting together by consensus. And protecting these important ecosystems is really a core part of our mandate. And that's why we require, even at the exploration phase, that the contractors are required to carry out these detailed environmental studies, collect environmental data, and pass it to the ISA where we make it publicly available to everybody in the world. And as you can see from uh, talking to Drennan, we use uh, or we require contractors to use the best available scientific evidence, which is why some of the very best scientific institutions in the world, such as the Natural History Museum, are carrying out this work on behalf of contractors because we require it. It's, it's a okay. fundamental part of our mandate. Con, is, is it naive of me to, to wonder whether, in fact, there's a better way of doing this? And that is to say, actually, we, you, you've got to find different ways of providing the materials you need uh, for green energy, tech, etc., etc., military apparatus, rather than going down to the sea floor and digging it up from there. You've got to find another way of doing this because we cannot allow such a wonderful resource to potentially be ruined. Well, you know... Uh... That would be ideal. Look, all mining is destructive. Whether you conduct it on land or whether you conduct it on the bottom of the sea, you will lose ecosystem values. The question is how to minimize that Can, uh, on land and on sea. One way of trying to assure some continuity of life, of the rich life that Jen has been describing, is the establishment of large no mining zones 
adjacent to the ones that you license. Um, the other, obviously, would be more public policy on recycling the materials we have. But that World Bank report that Michael cited does show pretty clearly that there will be a skyrocketing demand for those minerals and that we'll get them one way or another. And it's up to, uh, it's up to all of us to see if we can design a system that minimizes harm. As a scientist, Regan, I mean, when you look at what was, was down there, this must be your big concern, isn't, isn't it? That, that no matter what is done, as Con is saying, it is destructive. Yes, and I think that's just a fact of, of, as we can, it's still mining on large scale is still a way away. So I think it's more, and I, my motivation is currently to whatever the outcome to produce the best signs so that we can understand uh, and mitigate as much as we can. Um, uh, how far have you got so far? What, what, what are your best ideas on how to limit the damage? Um, well, we're still just to kind of give an idea of this kind of the scope uh, of understanding these ecosystems. I'm currently working on samples that were collected in 2013, 2015 on just uh, a baseline understanding of the biodiversity there. So going through describing species, uh, hundreds of new species are being described. Um, almost all the stuff we bring back is new designs and I'm still working on those samples and we still haven't got through it. So I think it's a big job and I think it's I think it's also an important part of the science is actually to be able to inform the public and inform society as a whole so they know what stake they have. Do you think it's true, I, I may have got this wrong, but I, I, think, I don't think I have, that there are more undiscovered species in the deep depths of the ocean than those that we have already found on the surface of our planet? Well, I wouldn't be surprised at all just from what I do to, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just looking through these samples from teeny tiny little kind of worms all the way up to more bigger recognizable things like starfish i think these areas are so there's kind of a last frontier on earth these they're so unexplored um and i think from a basic kind of human curiosity and exploration level that's quite exciting it's kind of like getting to go to the amazon first you know um so i think yeah that could definitely could be so i think that's why it's really important to do the best quality science we can to yeah. be able to inform the technology regulations society as well. I think it's ultimately a societal decision too. It's not just the decision of stake of, of individual stakeholders. If only we could together. all sit down and agree that it is the right thing to do and, and then do it, um, it would be a much be better world. But Charlotte, is this true as well, that the minerals that are down there it could also hold great medicinal value um, in, in terms of sort of finding cures for cancer, furthering the research into antibiotics, etc, etc. It could be Save. We have to go there. Yes, absolutely. The world is currently uh, running out of antibiotics that work. There's a big issue around antimicrobial resistance. We need to find new antibiotics and scientists believe that some of these, many of these can be found on the ocean floor. Um, so there's that interest too. But um, I wanted to pick up on a point from Con actually, which was about how to protect the complex biodiversity that we're talking about and you know that was the point you made about declaring no mining zones and um, I, I think that's critical and I think something we've not addressed yet is the uh, relationship China and other countries have with uh, states in the Pacific whose national interests are being affected by this. This is about geopolitics as well as environmental protection this is um, about China making deals, uh, drawing up contracts with countries like Fiji, Papua New Guinea, the Marshall Islands, um, where they are including access to the seabed or financing seabed mining. And these aren't wealthy these countries who, who might, might welcome the investment that they get from signing these, these deals. Absolutely. Um, that's another worry though, isn't it, Con, that we could actually sort of start to sort of see people down there um, exploiting it and if, if you've got the money, uh, even as Michael says, it's a, it's a financial barrier to entry. If once you capture what you need down there, then you become a very, very important player in the world geopolitically. Possibly. Um, I think you could draw an analogy to the uh, drilling and selling oil. Um, uh, there will be no doubt, I think, that uh, any nation 
that controls a large measure of the supply of seabed minerals will be a nation with resources. But that's pretty far gap from where we are now. This is, a, this is an embryonic industry. It's not even an infant industry. And uh, it will not approach anything like terrestrial levels of production, oh, for decades upon decades. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it's oh, sorry, a great sorry. idea to imagine, yeah. I didn't mean to stop you, carry on. No, no, well, it's, <clears throat> it's fun to imagine, you know, lots of bipeds living in wonderful domes and, uh, and colorful fishes swim by and they irrigate our gardens. But I think uh, life is a little more prosaic and the future won't be quite so comic booky. Okay, Michael, 2020, I think uh, the new rules under the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea, what you're working on, um, should come in, into force. Are you happy with where you are right now, 12 months or whatever away? Yes, we're doing very well. Uh, and uh, that is indeed the target date that is set by the ISA Council of 36 uh, member states. Uh, the next meeting takes place in Kingston in a few weeks' time. It will be streamed online for the whole world to watch if they wish to do so. And I hope that we can make uh, very good progress uh, at the next uh, meeting. Uh, certainly, that's uh, the indication so far. OK, will it become uh, the financial war and possibly a sort of um, a resources war at some point in the future? Do you think, Charlotte, I'm going to come back to you in a moment, Reagan, to end the programme, if I may? I think the... If not direct benefits, conflict, uh, but then some kind of conflict. To, to speculate too far and say it could result in conflict um, at this stage, I, I think, is a bit of a, a stab and in I the dark. And I don't mean physical conflict, I mean sort of confrontation, if you like. Yes, I think whoever holds the key to these precious resources will be in a, a position of, of real power and will be able to exert that politically and economically around the world, as we've seen um, countries do, not least China, with uh, you know, land-based resources and minerals. Um, and I think this next few years will be really critical in determining who has the power in the future and, um, and how that's used, because this is the, the chance we have, the window of opportunity, to create some robust regulation and um, ensure we have a, a framework uh, the ISA has a framework that's fit for purpose and um, the High Seas Alliance and other NGOs are calling for greater transparency in, in terms of the ISA's uh, mecha institutional mechanism. Well, they, 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 this meeting's coming up, so I'm sure that will be at least yes. discussed there. I mean, I just love pictures like this, Reagan. I mean, what is down there? It is extraordinary. I so wanted to go down in, in a deep capsule. Let me ask you this. As a scientist, uh, as a lover of what is down there, what will we lose if we mess this up? Uh, I think the main point is to make we don't fully know what we will lose because we still under, we don't under fully understand it. So we kind of we can't know what will be impacted if we don't know what is there to be impacted in the first place. Um, obviously, they're incredibly special environments, and I think uh, just emphasising the need to fully understand them. Also, uh, I think uh, being able to uh, improve kind of outreach point of view from a scientist's perspective, get the public engaged, get the public um, kind of invested and knowledgeable about the deep sea so they can be informed and have a stake in these decisions in the future as well. Um, and I think some, so for example, you said you wanted to look at uh, the deep sea. A lot of uh, deep sea research uh, expeditions, they live stream their, uh, their kind of underwater uh, robots essentially that's going on the Schmidt Ocean uh, Institute is currently live streaming their deep sea diving uh, in Costa Rica and anyone can just google that uh, google that and watch the live stream hear the scientists talking and it's like being in the room on the ship so I think but there is always this danger a bit like sort of when people went to the continent what is now the continent the United States of America um, and brought their diseases with them that they could even though perhaps they weren't necessarily wanting to do harm that they would just bring it with them and it inevitably happened and that of course is the big danger here we don't know what yeah. is down there we don't know how sensitive it is and we don't know how to behave do you think enough is being done um i think there's always room to improve and i think uh, just putting a really strong emphasis on making standardized widespread uh, kind of environmental regulation um but i think again what makes this unique is that obviously humanity does, doesn't have a good track record in terms of exploitation but I think what makes us unique is that there are these steps being made at the very first stage. The fact that scientists are being involved from the very start, I think that's a huge positive to take away. Massive responsibility, Michael. Indeed it is. And uh, 
we uh, fully intend to carry that out in a responsible way. Uh, we, at the moment, we have approved 29 contracts for exploration involving 22 different countries, and that covers about 0.7% of the whole of the deep seabed area, which is about uh, less than half a percent of the world's oceans. So we're actually talking about very small parts here. Uh, and by the way, I do fully agree with the point that was made by Con earlier that uh, we need large, uh, no mining areas that will be set aside and preserved. This is a fundamental part of our work to design and, uh, these areas in the most responsible and environmentally sensible way. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So perhaps the final frontier isn't somewhere out there. It is somewhere down there. Con Michael, thank you very much indeed. Charlotte Regan, thank you for coming on. Thank you for watching. We've been talking about what lies beneath. That's always the case with Roundtable. I hope. See you next time. Bye-bye.